Thomas. The mail just arrived, very dangerous. All right, welcome everyone to day two of our third annual Critical Access Hospital uh, virtual conference. We're gonna just give it a minute for everybody's piling in, it looks like from the waiting room. All right, let's get started. So like I said, welcome to day two of our third annual Critical Access Hospital Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. I'm Opal Greenway, a principal at Stradwater. Happy to be with you guys this morning. I'm joined by my colleague, Melissa Schmidt, who is also in the Physician Advisory Group with me. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Um, participants, you will be muted automatically. If you have a question to ask, please feel free to go ahead and use the chat and the Q&A function that is on Zoom. All of these sessions are being recorded and the slides and the recordings are gonna be made available to all registrants. They'll be sent out to you. And as this is our third annual conference, we will, we've will we been getting great feedback each year that has helped us improve um, the content and making sure we're meeting your needs each year. So please take the time to fill out that short survey that follows each conference session. It really helps us figure out what new, what um, information you guys need and how to make the conference the most available um, beneficial to you. So a little bit about Stroudwater for those of you who are new to joining um, us at this conference or have not been familiar with us in the past. Stroudwater was established in 1985. We've been around for 38 years serving communities across the United States. As you can see from this map, we are a national firm. We have been working in all 50 states. This is just who we've helped since 2017. As a firm, we are very much focused on the specific needs of rural community hospitals and health systems that have have a large impact on rural. Rural is greatly under-resourced. You have such great and bright talents, um, but oftentimes don't have the resources to fully be able to make sure your communities have the best patient access and what you guys need. So we specifically are here to address your needs and help you make sure that you guys can have a thriving and sustainable healthcare system for your, um, for your communities. We were very excited in 2020 to launch Stroudwater Capital Partners, which is our capital arm that helps find financing for all of your capital needs uh, for your organizations. So that rebuild of the hospital, especially dealing with today's interest rates, finding access to capital is not an easy thing. It is a very uh, a lot of paperwork. And we know that with how many um, the lack of resources sometimes that we have and all the different hats we have to wear, it's always helpful to help have somebody help you find the money to be able to do what you need to in your organization. So we launched Stroudwater Capital Partners in 2020 and have been very excited to have them partner with us over the years. As a firm, we are a full service strategic operational and financial advisory firm. Um, as I mentioned, I lead the physician advisory group, but we offer everything from, we have sessions today on um, mergers, affiliations and partnerships, strategic planning, um, our bricks and bucks group working with that Stroudwater Capital Partners, we do revenue cycle, clinical and quality, staffing and productivity, et cetera. So happy to help you with anything that you guys need um, and making sure that we are making um, keeping healthcare great and rural. So today, kicking off our session, Melissa and I want to talk to you guys about a project that we have been working on um, and just finished up in the state of North Carolina. So we have been putting, we put on a significant clinic manager training project for the state of North Carolina, and we have some lessons that we've learned through it that we are happy to share with you today. So this started out really, it was a statewide project, right? This is, it was funded by the SHIP grant that was, um, that a lot of states you guys have access to and provide to all of your hospitals that are in your rural communities that are under 50 beds. And what we were working with was while several of the different hospitals in the state of North Carolina that are SHIP eligible pick individual projects, there were some hospitals that came together and said, how do we get the most bang for our buck, right? We all have some problems that we're dealing with. We have some significant staffing shortages and the organizational capacity of our organizations is really limited. And so rather than just having an individual project that based off of the SHIP funds, which is usually about $13,000 per hospital, and having that some specific to us, can we pull some of our resources together to have a larger project that benefits the entire state? On top of that, North Carolina as a state has a lot of um, health systems, 
And with the health systems, it's very, you know, I think there's only four or five independent hospitals still in North Carolina. And so with the health systems mentality, you know, they're doing smaller projects under ship. They're wanting a lot of cohesion and making sure it works with overall corporate strategy. So um, several of those hospitals came together and said, we would like to go ahead and allocate our ship funds to do something that's statewide, something that would benefit the entire state. And so what we did is we worked with Nick Galvez and Renee Clark at the State Office of Rural Health to come up with a project where we could have the most bang for our buck. And what we decided was how can we train as many frontline managers as possible in the rural hospitals across the state? We need to be able to do it in an efficient manner where this, it, it worked for people who were working as part of a hospital system or whether or not they were part of an independent hospital. So that, that way everybody could have the benefit and really could address this issue of organizational capacity. And what we did is we came up with how could we train them remotely around some areas that would create some immediate ROI for these organizations. We picked revenue cycle and out focusing on outpatient clinics. While I'm not gonna get into revenue cycle today and that training that we did with them, we're gonna focus on the clinics. One part of the thing that we were thinking about was, all right, we need to make sure that these are people who we noticed that there's been a lot of turnover that had been happening in these positions. Um, during the pandemic, there's oftentimes these organizations didn't have time to train new people in these roles. These people still had full-time day jobs. Oftentimes they were given administrative responsibilities and here's an additional 50 cents an hour. And that was their now their position where they were now in charge of their clinics. Sometimes they were in charge of multiple clinics while they still had to check in patients or room patients. And this might be their first time really working with administration. So there were a lot of different hurdles that they had without the ability to do a lot of training. We opted to do virtual training for the specific reason that in-person training, a lot of organizations, since these people had full-time day jobs of actually actively working in the clinic, it was going to be very difficult for organizations to send people to go and do, say, a two-day training seminar um, across the state coming from all over the place. You know, hospitals were really hesitant to do that. And so what we decided instead was to break up the training actually and do it virtually over a series of weeks. So each week, um, the hospitals would send their clinic managers just to do during, we picked the lunch break for recognizing most clinics did shut down at lunchtime. Could their clinic managers attend training for one hour a week for several weeks in a row to get trained that way? All of our training included handouts and takeaways that they could implement immediately. So we made sure that there were checklists, that there, there were scripts, that there were different pieces that so if a, ma a manager attended the session, but then they could print out and they could put it immediately into their binder, right, that, that they had at their clinic of saying, okay, here's, you know, let's take this process. Here's a checklist for how we should be able to do patient check-in. Let's make a few edits to make it really relevant for us and the types of patients we need. And then we, here we go. Here's our new process. So as much of a handbook as we could possibly hand these practice managers. We also wanted to make sure that we could appropriately address this new HR role that people had. For the first time, people were working now in charge of their friends, the people that they had been working side by side with in their community. And at that practice, they're now going to be in charge. So we had to make sure there was a, an appropriate HR and administrative responsibility um, understanding with the training. And then also just how do you do this when you don't have allocated administrative time? So can you know wearing those multiple hats as we do in rural a lot of people in administration have been very very used to it but maybe your front desk person who's recently been promoted to manager had not so the training that we put together was really designed to how do we address all of these objectives without being disruptive to the organizations knowing that they couldn't let their resources go for a significant period of time to be trained and lastly, what we wanted to make sure is that this is something that could live on, that the organization had a recording that they could include this in their onboarding handbook so that even if recognizing turnover is still going to happen. So if you're going to have turnover, do you have a way of still engaging those new people without having to send them to additional training? Could you give them access to the recordings? Could you give them access to the handouts and the takeaways that happen in each of these? And so it really could become part of the organizational HR training for anybody who would be putting in this position, regardless of when they started. Um, and then it would be also flexible so that if somebody missed one week,
they could catch up and go back in the next week and it wouldn't um, impede them or they wouldn't feel behind unnecessarily. So with that, um, Melissa, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how we really approached you know, the fundamentals of this training session? Yeah, so hi everyone. To Opal's point, um, management in itself of people is new to a lot of our leaders and it can be overwhelming. And so we kick off a lot of our presentations with this quote. Um, I'll just read it to you quickly here. Leadership at its core isn't about you. It's about how effective you are at unleashing other people Full stop. That's it. That's the secret. Uh, it's about empowering other people as a result of your presence, right? Um, so we like to set the tone for our leaders in these trainings and kind of uh, stress how important leadership is and what it means to support our teams, be there for them and empower them to be able to do this without us there every second of the day, right? Because a lot of us are wearing multiple hats um, and we're new to this and we want to make sure our people have what they need to be successful. So the four focus areas that we we included for these presentations were clinic management expectations for new managers. We called this uh, practice management 101. Uh, in this in this presentation, we covered topics like human resources, operations, and and uh, administrative responsibilities of the provider. So for HR, we focused really on what the clinic manager would need to utilize for this. So. Um, we talked about recruiting new people to our practice and what writing good job descriptions looks like, what behavioral interviewing means, how we can how we can standardize our interview process to make it more efficient and to make sure we're hiring the right fits for our positions. Um, we talked about expectations for orientation and how we can create checklists to make sure that we're covering everything we want to. Um, and, and with that expectation setting for new hires and helping them understand the clinic and what we want, what we need from them to be successful. Um, we also talked about the importance of training, right? There's competencies for nurses, but what does training look like for our full team and in terms of just the clinic itself? So creating creating efficient checklists and things so we make sure we don't miss anything, uh, assigning onboarding buddies, et cetera, and just meeting setting expectations with our staff and meeting with them regularly to make sure that their onboarding is going the way that we want it to. Um, we talked about retention, right? How So we we recruit these folks on, we get them oriented, we get them trained. How do we keep them, right? Retention is a big thing for a lot of us right now. We talked about the importance of rounding and what that looks like to check in with our team members and to make sure that things are going how we think they're going, right? Um, getting their feedback, understanding what's working, what's not working. Um, we talked about performance evaluations in this and making sure that they are helpful for the employee, right? Help, like make sure they know what they're being evaluated on and that they're on board with that uh, before, the, before we even get started in the clinic, just making sure they understand what your expectations are. Um, we also talked about performance improvement, right? What do we do when, when our expectations are not being met and what difficult conversations can look like and how we can manage some of those in our clinics. Um, and then lastly, for practice for human resources, we talked about engagement, right? For uh, patients and staff and providers and what that looks like. A lot of us have surveys built in, but what do we do? What do we do in addition to the surveys and how do we respond to the feedback from those surveys? In terms of operations, we talked about the front office uh, pretty heavily. That's It's the heart of the clinic. It's where the magic happens. Uh, we talked about the process up front, things we can look at, things we can monitor, what the paperwork situation is, who's managing the phones and how. And then we talked a little bit about scheduling, um, but that was a full second webinar here. And then lastly, for practice management 101, we talked about the provider and some of the administrative responsibilities and the importance of locking charts and um, how, how their templating is set up, et cetera. Um, and then just the patient care in general. Um, for scheduling 101, this was this was a pretty heavy webinar, right, and really important for a lot of our offices. Uh, we talked, of course, first about eligibility, making sure our patients are eligible uh, before they even come in. We talked about automating processes to help make things a little lighter and a little easier on our front office that is often super overwhelmed, right? What can we automate? What we have the capability for? Um, and then we talked about things to consider before we even design a template for scheduling. What are some things that we need to make sure that we're accounting for? Volume expectations, appointment types, um, nuances with our providers, right, and our staffing levels. Um, we then dove a little bit into some creative concepts for scheduling. So we talked about 
stream scheduling, wave scheduling, open access and staggered schedules. There's a million ways to do this, but we, we focused in on those four to help, help folks understand what might or might not be appropriate for their clinics and their teams. Um, and then lastly, with this one, we talked about the stuff that gets in the way of everything I just said, right? We can create a really efficient, really great template, but inevitably there's bottlenecks to the template. And how do we troubleshoot those um, things like cancellations, no-shows, staffing levels, right? So just talked about kind of navigating some of those things and what we can do to mitigate things ahead of time. Um, our third webinar here was about data-driven decision-making and interpreting hospital reports. So we talked about why that's important, right? Why do, why do we manage our metrics and, and how do we do this? Um, we talked about setting KPIs and making sure they're aligned with your organization. So what are your goals and, and what how do you set yourself up for success in meeting them? So effective scheduling and patient throughput. Um, this chart here is an example of a time study, right? So you can really monitor your patient throughput and understand where are things being held up? Why do certain days look different than others um, following the patient journey from the minute they walk in the door through when they leave the clinic, right? So what is their experience like? What, where, where are things bottlenecking? What can we change in the future to make things more consistent and in line with what our goals are? Um, and then we also talked about examples of metrics that you may want to include. Um, you may want to monitor for your clinic based on your goals. And we talked about benchmarking for comparison and we showed them some example dashboards. So this is an example dashboard here. Um, we talked about different things they would they would could include and could monitor in a financial dashboard versus an operational dashboard, right? So your finances, you're gonna look at co-pays and you're gonna look at RVUs and you're gonna look at budget. Right. Whereas like your operational one, you're going to look at your no shows and your cancellations and you're going to focus on what's really working or not working in your clinics. And then the last thing we talked about uh, our last webinar was on referral management. Um, so really building relationships with our referral sources and making sure that those continue um, so that we can continue to grow our practice. Right. So. How do we initiate, how are, how are referrals initiated and, and is our process working? How is our team tracking these referrals as they come in and what are we doing to make sure that there's follow-up? Um, what does the communication look like? And then how do we continue to promote our practice with, with these folks that are referring to us? How do we continue to let them know about the services we're providing and what we can do for them? Right. And then alternatively, how do we troubleshoot when things go wrong? Right. When somebody refers to our office and isn't able to get their patient and doesn't want to refer again, how do we how do we bridge that relationship? How do we fix it and foster it going forward? Um, and then we provided checklists and different charts and templates for folks to take with them after these trainings so that they understood how to set this up for themselves. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, Melissa, is that as we are going through this, as Melissa was going through the time study, one of our big goals with this was to help establish for all of these new clinic managers the critical th thinking that was now required of, of their job that wasn't previously and how to utilize some of these tools to also better engage with administration and so and gain access to information that they probably weren't familiar with. So a lot of times somebody who is new in this role um, looking at a financial dashboard for the first time can be super overwhelming. So we talked about how do you start small? What are the metrics that, you know, finance? How do you start working with the finance team that has a member of revenue cycle that probably has somebody from accounting, that has somebody from payroll it's, um, to understand the financial aspects of the dashboard and engaging with other members of your team to learn some of this stuff. So we can teach you a lot about, okay, here's how you should look at copay collections Here's how you should look at collections to work our views. Here's how you should look at budget versus actual. But to really step up from being just a supervisor to being a manager, it's not just about being able to explain the, explain the numbers. It's how do you use these numbers to work with the rest of the team that's at the hospital to make sure that it, everybody understands just how important the clinic is, why it's really important to be with the clinic and be trans, um, transparent with them about what expectations are so that you can work together on that. Um, one of the things that we also went through was building out that pro forma for bringing in a new provider. So if you're bringing in a brand new provider, how does you, how do you as the practice administrator incorporate that person into it? You shouldn't just be given a top down direction from a CEO of saying, oh, by the way, we have this new provider starting in two weeks, you know, make sure that they're all set up, right? You need, what are the questions you need to ask administration? Okay. Show me the pro forma, show me the business case for it. First of all, I should hope, like we did talk to them about 
if you know all of this stuff, you can engage with an administration and say, here, I need to be part of this process of bringing in a new provider rather than simply finding out on the back end and being handed, oh, by the way, figure all of this out. You can engage with them about, okay, you show me the pro forma you've presented to the provider. Here's my feedback about it. Like whether or not we want to make sure that we can be really realistic as to what those expectations are. Because if you promise a, prov um, a physician that they're going to have a nurse practitioner to help them and be part of a team-based care model within the first six months, and you as a practice administrator is looking, where am I going to put this person? And not, and not to mention, I've just lost two staff people that you still haven't filled. It's really important to have your seat at the table. And this is very new for a lot of these people. So we went through in these training modules how to have those conversations to get your seat at the table when you might be brand new in that role and how that can be a really difficult um, position to be in to start engaging with administration about have, how do you participate in the decision making in a way that will actually help you do your job better in addition and make sure it's successful and how that actually impacts the overall retention of the clinic, not just of providers, which are very expensive for the administration to deal with provider turnover, but frankly, you as a new manager, your own job satisfaction so that you will enjoy the role and continue to grow in the role rather than say, you know what, and how to identify this isn't for me. Maybe this isn't, this is too much. This is not the kind of job that I want. But and also to identify who are the fellow leaders in your clinic, right? If we, I go back to that quote that Melissa started with, we really focused on if you can bring this mindset to everything that you do, you will be successful. I mean, really, this is one of those where an A for effort actually does make an impact in the clinic because simply putting on that mentality, and if you can put on that mentality, how it works throughout the entire clinic. So we really tethered that into every single one of these training sessions so people could see how applying that mentality, even to the small things, will help build their confidence as a practice manager and it will encourage them to identify other leaders that will help support them within the clinic. You don't have to have a title to be a leader and, and actually really build that organizational capacity. So really it would be a way of building upon, you know, these training sessions to develop better practice, true managers, as opposed to supervisors, especially for people who are new, but also to build organizational capacity through leadership development of, you know, you can apply leadership development in even the most basic training sessions. If you can help leaders develop that mentality and that thought process, that way of, this is how I should address problems. I may not have a template from Stroudwater of exactly what to do in this situation, but now I have the right mindset and the critical thinking capabilities to know what questions do I need to ask to get the answers I need. And that was what was so important for us with this training session. It's not just about handing out templates in another handbook for somebody to read. It's about engaging with them. So with that being said, what, um, when we look at how the program went, it was really important to us to actually provide people after the training sessions, individual follow-up assistance. So anybody who after any session that they attended, or if you missed it and you watched a recording, could call us up and say, hey, here's my provide, here's my template that I'm looking at. And here's how I'm thinking through it. Is this the right way? Is this what you were talking about? Um, he, and you know, for us to engage with them about and ask them questions. So it, when somebody called up and said, Okay, I, you know, we currently have this open access schedule for this new provider. How should I come up with what my threshold is for when I shift them to maybe a way to potentially a wave? So we talked through that with them of like, because it's, it's not a set answer. There's no best practice that says when a provider's schedule is 60% full, you should transition from open to wave. That's not how te templating works, right? Templating is an iterative process. And so they had to develop those critical thinking skills of looking at their clinics in totality in order to know what was best for them and when they're, how to develop their threshold and trigger point. So we were able to meet with register, um, people who attended this webinar who had questions one-on-one -on -one to actually walk them through and being able to give them feedback as to how they were thinking through their problems. Um, and that's actually an ongoing process. We have a call actually right after the conference today with another group that has said, hey, Kay, hey, follow up from our from our session. I, brought, I have some more issues that I want to talk to you guys about. So we put this program together. We did this training 
Um, we had 20 different hospitals participate, which was fantastic with 50 people, you know, registered across um, across the state who didn't have to travel. So the hospitals were thrilled that they didn't have to shut down clinic to send, you know, a key resource out to get trained. Um, but with that, you know, we were able to address the state's needs for increasing this capacity in rural. Right. We need better. We need to continue to develop our leaders across all of rural. We need to be able to identify who the new leaders are in our organizations and how do we set them up for success when training prior to this really just looked like, OK, shadow somebody for a day and then you do the job. Well, in a lot of these organizations, the person who they would shadow isn't there anymore. There's been turnover. We had open positions um, and people are having to wear multiple hats. And so they were never trained in these positions and they didn't have time to get properly trained. Not to mention, it's not like there was a, it's really apples to apples where they could send a nurse manager from a department in the hospital to come and train them. You couldn't do that. It wasn't, it, it wasn't necessarily applicable. So by actually for the state combining these resources together, we were able to reach so many hospitals, as I said, 20 different hospitals participated in the training to have their actual managers trained. We were able to give individual follow-up and assistance to those, um, like I said, additional. And then we actually shared all of this across the entire state. So for those that did not read, um, did not send their people to be trained, we went ahead and shared everything with the entire state of everybody who was SHIP eligible. So if you didn't have, maybe you ha still had an opening in your practice, you didn't have a new practice manager identified, they still got all of the materials and will have access to the training session. They have all those recordings in order to, hey, when they finally do get somebody in that position, they can properly be trained and the hospitals have those resources for any future people. And um, we were very pleased that across the board, people were finding stuff that they could implement immediately. As you can see below, you know, 100% um, of people were happy with the training that they got. And you know, eight, um, eighty-three, four percent were actually had things that they could implement immediately, which to us is just a, it's just a huge win. So I want to make sure that we do leave a little bit of time for Q and A if people have questions um, about the project. Um, oh, and one thing I will have to because I have to give a shout out for this: we are partnering with NOSOR, the National Organization for State Offices of Rural Health, and actually taking the learnings from this and providing this to independent rural health clinics in an eight part series that started, this is today's session number three later today, um, an independent RHC Institute across the entire country that we have, um, I think over 150 RHCs that are participating nationwide in getting, getting better training for them, which really also helps hospitals and rural who partner with these independent rural health, health clinics that they're going to be able to operate and learn um, a lot of these things that like RHC 101 um, and running their practices since so many of them have been out on their own. Um, so that I, I put that out there to address one of the questions that came in of saying, hey, are you doing this in other states? We are doing this in other states. We've done it um, this year. We did it in North Carolina, West Virginia and New York. And we are happy to if you are interested in this, we've also done it for individual hospitals, especially we have had a couple of hospitals that have multiple clinics and say, can you just do something for our hospital with our clinics um, specific to us? We have we have done that for a few hospitals um, that have been interested in that. So we've got about one more minute in case anybody else has any other questions. And by the way, if you have other follow up, here's Melissa's and my contact information. Well, with that, it looks like I am. we are actually at time. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues, um, Claire Kelly and Jeff Summer, who are joined by the CEO of Huggins, Jeremy Roberge. They're going to be talking to you today about how to deal with unwinding an affiliation, which basically is hospital divorce. So um, is <laughs> which nobody is. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting topic. And so with that, I will turn it over and um, thank you, everybody, for having us today. Thank you, Opal. Thanks, Melissa. Let me get our presentation set up for you. All righty. So as Opal so eloquently put, 
We're going to be talking about unwinding and affiliation, lessons learned and reflections. We're super excited to have Jeremy Roberge here with us today. He's the CEO of Huggins Hospital um, in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Huggins has been through, we can say, some transitions in the past few years. They've joined um, with a couple other hospitals to create a health system. They've witnessed that health system try to partner with another health system, and they, then, they themselves have withdrawn from a health system. So a wealth of knowledge on all things transactions. We're really excited to, to pick his brain about what some of that was like today. A bit of background. Again, my name is Claire Kelly. I'm a senior consultant with Stradwater. I specialize in our affiliations and partnership sector, along with our strategy that includes strategic risk and strategic options. Again, super honored to have Jeremy Roberts here with us today, CEO of Huggins Hospital in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Jeremy has been um, part of the senior leadership team at Huggins since 2012. His other roles have been chief financial officer and senior vice president. So a wealth of knowledge on Huggins Hospital has been there a while, understands the long-term trends there. Before Huggins, he was at Androscoggin Valley Hospital, as well as Coos County Family Health Services in Berlin, New Hampshire. So not only does he know Huggins, he knows New Hampshire super well and really understands the dynamics that are at play in that market. For those of you who are not from New Hampshire or don't know what, what area we're talking about, we want to orient you with the kind of geography that's going on here. Um, these are the maps um, that show where Huggins Hospital is. As you can see, Huggins is really just over the border of Maine on that New Hampshire Maine border. That orange highlighted area there is the service area for Huggins Hospital composed of 15 zip codes. Those 15 zip codes drift into three different counties and the populations within those zip codes um, range from about 33,000 individuals to 120,000 individuals due to seasonality that's happening in that area. It's a beautiful area. It's right on a lake. It's a large vacation destination. It's, it's really stunning. Huggins itself is a critical access hospital, is a very, very strong critical access hospital, not just in financials, but also in market share. They have had the largest all-payer market share at over 20% for some time in their service area. And additionally, their financial position outside um, um, of COVID-19 funding is strong. I think in fiscal year 2022, they had days cash on hand that were over 80. So again, very strong financial position. And on top of all of that, they had a new hospital that was completed in 2010. So you walk in the front doors of Huggins and it's just beautiful, a stunning entryway. It's, it's really gorgeous. We also want to talk about Granite One Health. This was the health system that Huggins formed along with another critical access hospital, Mednadnock Community Hospital, and a larger PPS hospital, Catholic Medical Center, or CMC. They formed Granite One Health in 2016. And on this map, you can see the orange other highlighted dots are where Catholic Medical Center and Mednadnock Community Hospital are based. On top of that, Granite One Health looked into a partnership with Dartmouth Health, um, and you can see on this map where Dartmouth Health is by those green, uh, green dots on this map. So to give you an idea of the timeline of what we're talking about before we launch into our conversation, 2016, Huggins Hospital, along with CMC and Monadnock Community Hospital, formed Granite One. In May of 2022, <clears throat> the New Hampshire Attorney General objected to a merger of Dartmouth Health and Granite One Health. Granite One and Dartmouth had been in negotiation for some time, but the New Hampshire Attorney General disapproved of that um, as it, he believed it would violate the um, state constitution that requires free and fair competition within New Hampshire. So then in the summer of 2022, Stradwater was retained by Huggins Hospital to evaluate their strategic risk position and strategic options position um, and look into the use of their exit clause. Huggins is a unique situation where they had an exit clause to leave their union with Granite One Health. That exit clause, however, was set to expire in November of 2022. So it was evaluation to see, okay, do we, do we continue with this partnership or do we look to withdraw from the partnership and run an independent strategy? So in October 2022, after we had done and completed this analysis and had lots of discussions, um, Huggins Hospital actually voted to withdraw from and dissolve Granite One Health. So that's an idea of, of our timeline. So welcome, Jeremy. So glad we could have you with us today for this, for this conversation. How the heck are you today? Good, good. Thank you so much for the great introduction and intro. I got a lot to live up to here. I feel the pressure now. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump right in. So, 
we understand that when you became CEO of Huggins, you the Huggins already had conversations going with prospective partners. Um, how would you describe Huggins' strategic and financial position at that time? Yeah, actually, it even started before that, as you showed in my kind of bio, I started at Huggins in 2012 as the CFO, Senior Vice President and CFO. And even before that time, Huggins was already in discussions with uh, potential partners and looking to find uh, the right affiliation for Huggins. And I think what really drove that before I got to Huggins was Huggins did have a few years of declining financial results from about 2008. And then, you know, yes, it's great to have this beautiful facility that you mentioned. However, that did come with some financial struggles, getting into the building, higher depreciation, higher expense of operating a new facility, those kind of things compounded with what happened in the economy in 2008. All those things kind of drove Huggins to be in a very concerning situation. And our board at that time that I came into Huggins really felt strongly that the only way we'd survive would be to find um, a system for us to join. Um, so I came here as CFO during that. You know, I felt I did agree with the board at that time. Things weren't looking great for Huggins and, and we were really focused on finding an affiliation. And then, as you mentioned, I did become CEO of Huggins Hospital, interim CEO in 2015. And we had already started working on um, forming Granite One Health. And the, one of the first things I ended up doing as CEO, literally like a week or two after I agreed to be the interim CEO was signing a letter of intent to form Granite One Health. With CSC. What an entrance. Yeah, I know. Good, <laughs> great way to start things off. But, but as you mentioned, I knew what was going on. I was a part of it, mm -hmm. not necessarily leading it, but as a CFO, I did have a role in it. So it was kind of interesting to see that happen. But, you know, I will say things kind of shifted from there where um, we went from looking at an affiliation as like our only strategic initiative to recognizing that an affiliation really needed to be more of a tactic to our strategic plan. So I really do think where we are today financially is largely a result of us shifting that mentality over time to recognizing that, you know, maybe an affiliation helps us get what we want, but it isn't really like our strategic plan, which I think is the way the board looked at it when I first came to Huggins was, this is what we need to focus on. We're going to become part of a system that'll solve all our problems. But having seen what happened during that time frame, we've shifted back to, you know, these are the things we're trying to do for our community. Does being in a system actually help that or not? Yeah, I think that's a great perspective to have. How did you guys, you know, you've been looking for a partner for a while. Um, how, what kind of approach did you use when looking for a partner? Yeah, I think we did a little too much maybe on our own early on before bringing in help from attorneys and consultants like Stroud Water. And I think, again, I think our board was maybe a little too heavily involved in some ways and maybe not aligned well with leadership on that. So there was a bit of a push and pull on where to go. And I think we just looked at it more from a regional standpoint initially and said, well, you know, Wentworth Douglas was one of the first hospitals we tried to affiliate with. They're about 50 minutes away from Huggins, south of us, um, on kind of more of the major roadway. So it seemed like it made sense. And, but the reality was we weren't aligned with them strategically. We weren't aligned with them culturally and that didn't work out. So then we went to another partner, CMC, who we did have um, a relationship with over the years for cardiology services. And again, it was almost like making an assumption since we had that, we it made sense to align with them. And so then we went in that direction. So you can kind of see, hopefully I'm kind of giving you a feel for the fact that we probably didn't do enough of our homework on some of these things and made assumptions about things. And now in hindsight, realized there was a better way to do that. <laughs> Hindsight's always 2020. So yeah. you mentioned, you know, with CMC, you had cardiology services aligned. You already had a relationship with them. What were the other, you know, top three motivating factors that really encouraged you to, to form Granite One Health with, with CMC at the time? Yeah, I think one of the things we did do enough homework on was knowing that creating Granite One wasn't going to be the last step for us. So one of the biggest motivating factors was if we could come together with Catholic Medical Center and Monadnock, who at the time were three fairly strong hospitals. Again, Huggins was starting to ramp things up by 2015, heading in the right direction. 
Uh, Monadnock, like Huggins, is one of the larger critical access hospitals in New Hampshire. So we thought if the three of us come together, then when we try to get into a system like Dartmouth Health, we're going to get so much more out of that affiliation because we're going to be three hospitals, a kind of a good size system will be aligned and we can go in and we can drive home like what it is we want to get from Dartmouth and we can dictate things a little bit better. So that was probably one of the biggest motivating factors was thinking this would help us get more out of a bigger system once we took that next step. Um, some of the other ones a little bit smaller, but things that oftentimes I think hospitals are looking for, we had thought that would help us get a better electronic medical record. Even before we got into a larger system, one of our initiatives was to align our medical records among Catholic Medical Center, Huggins and Monadnock. And then probably the last one, the third one is one, again, most people talk about when they join a system was bringing more clinical services to the community and keeping healthcare local and at home and those kind of things. And so those are probably the three big ones, trying to get into a big system, better electronic medical record, and hoping to get more services here in the Wolfboro area. Yeah, I mean, those are all really valid reasons and things we commonly see, you know, being able to provide better services to your community and more enhanced, nuanced services to your community, and then also having leverage with, with larger health systems. So you joined Granite One, you're with Granite One for five years since 2016, and I'll, frankly, you had a lot of major events happen during that time. You had a global pandemic, <laughs> and then you had this proposed and ultimately failed merger with with Dartmouth Health. What kind of began to change Huggins' mindset about Granite One, you know, including some of those big factors? Yeah, maybe I'll start off by saying of all the things I worried about when I decided to become the CEO of Huggins Hospital, <laughs> running a hospital through a pandemic never crossed my mind. And I think <laughs> had it, I wouldn't be talking to you today as a CEO. I would have said, nah, I'll pass. So, I mean, <laughs> I'll start off by mentioning that. I mean, it's kind of interesting. You know, you, you talk about joining systems to help you through the worst of times, you know, help you through financial struggles, a pandemic, which maybe we didn't think of directly, but you would think it would have helped. But I think having gone through that, it was really reflective. We kind of reflected on that and said, you know, we didn't really gain a lot from being in a loosely held system. I'll mention that. I mean, we didn't talk about that yet. It wasn't a really controlling system. It was more of a federation of the three hospitals. We really didn't gain a lot. You know, we kind of went through the pandemic largely on our own and did okay with it. Um, I think some of the other things that factored in to us rethinking being in Granite One were that we really didn't accomplish a lot of the goals we wanted. You could blame the pandemic. You could blame us trying to focus on Dartmouth. There's definitely some truth to both of those things. But I think the reality was when I looked back through the, I think it was like a 300 page like implementation plan we developed, there really wasn't much in there we were gonna accomplish successfully with Catholic Medical Center. It's not a knock on them. It's just, they have limited resources. They're kind of a specialty hospital that focuses on cardiology. So getting more services like, you know, helping out with uh, general surgery, orthopedics, urology, ENT, you name it, whatever it is, those really weren't strong for them anyway. And were things we kind of realized we should have thought more about probably, you know, before joining Green at One. But I think one of the other biggest things that made us really rethink it was, as I already mentioned, what we hoped to accomplish by developing Granite One was to help us get into a bigger system. And in reality, that made it harder for Huggins to get into Dartmouth because as you mentioned on the slide, I think that we still have up, um, you know, you talked about how the state became concerned about uh, free and fair competition. Catholic Medical Center is in Manchester, New Hampshire, the largest city in New Hampshire. And the state got really kind of spooked by Catholic Medical Center becoming Dartmouth, which is part of Dartmouth, which is the only academic medical center in New Hampshire. And that that would take away competition in the Manchester area. And the entire focus of the state became Manchester. And in reality, what we realized after spending all those years trying to get into Dartmouth as part of Granite One is it would have been easier for us to do it alone. Uh, the state had no concerns with the Wolfboro area. It's not a market that they were worried would give up competition by us becoming part of Dartmouth. So, you know, we're going through the pandemic, not really achieving the goals we wanted, seeing that in a way, it didn't really help us get into a bigger system with, um, with more success, or it blocked it entirely, ironically. Um, a lot of those things kind of factored in us, this, making the decision to then withdraw from Granite One. 
Yeah, so you mentioned two things that I want to dig into a little bit more. The first being, you know, being in a bigger system made it harder to join with a larger system. And the second being that Granite One was, I'll use your term, a loose federation of different hospitals. Kind of describe what that looked like. And I know you guys had a unique circumstance with an exit clause and describe kind of, you know, how that exit clause affected that that federation. Sure. Yeah, those are all great great questions and things I, I definitely want to talk about. Um, so yeah, we went into it thinking, all right, well, we're not going to do this as a tightly controlled system where we were giving up a lot of control of the Catholic Medical Center. We wanted to do it where they had some reserve powers at the granite one level, but not really giving up control. And then, as you mentioned, one of the key things that we thought was a huge win for us was negotiating an exit clause that essentially gave us during a period of time for any reason or no reason at all, we could decide, anyone in the in the system of Granite One could decide we want out. It, at the time, our board, our leadership team felt like that was a huge win. And yes, it's helping us get out and I'm very happy about that. But I think I, I, think I re would be remiss if I didn't say, and I think this is one of the key points I wanna make for everybody that's a part of this Zoom is be careful what you ask for. Yes, it helped us get out. But I think in hindsight, reflecting on that, it also really had everyone never fully buy into the system, right? Why would CMC want to invest in bringing specialists to Huggins, maybe even investing financially in Huggins, if at any time I could be like, hey, you know what, guys, I'm out. See you later. I've decided I don't want this. And you can kind of look back and see where all of us at some point realized we were never really fully vested in the system. And then, as I mentioned, once we struggled with getting into Dartmouth, it became very clear, you know, this probably wasn't going to work and we might want to use that exit clause to get out. So again, it, it really ended up being that double-edged sword of, yes, it was nice to have. I'm glad we have it because now we can regroup and rethink things and get out of Granite One, get out of it without lawsuits or hard feelings. Thankfully, all three organizations agreed to kind of exercise the exit clause at the same time and dissolve Granite One. But really, I think it hurt us because we were never fully invested in being a part of a system. I think that's such a great point. It's understanding, you know, both both sides to the to the story of, hey, yeah, you have that ability. Your board has that ability to say, hey, if this isn't working out for us, we can leave. But at the same time, you're not providing your partner with any incentive to make sure they're investing in you and keeping you at the table for, for conversations. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, Huggins is in this, in this position, you're in the affiliation at this time. How did evaluating your strategic position and options help Huggins decide whether or not they wanted to stay with Granite One and whether or not they wanted to exercise that, that exit clause? Yeah, as I mentioned a little bit previously, I think there was a bit of a mindset shift that I'd like to think I helped a little bit with where our board was so focused on, we need a system to solve our problems. This will help us get to where we need to be. Shifting back to let's focus on what's important to our community in Huggins and then see, does a being in a system help? And when we did that, you know, I'll just mention a little bit about that process too, which I think was something, something I'm really proud of. And I think it was really incredible. We redid our strategic plan in 2017, so about a year or so after I became CEO. Um, and we involved about 160 people throughout the organization, the community, in developing that strategic plan. So we had buy-in from day one, from our staff, from you know people that were involved in it. And I think that really helped to kind of reset things for Huggins. It was important for me as a CEO to have a, a good, strong plan that I believed in. And it was great yeah. that we included so many people in the process. That was something I had never done before. And, and quite frankly, it was a little nerve wracking as a CEO to think I was giving up so much control to so many people. But, <laughs> you know, we obviously guided it. And we made sure we were involved in the process and, and kind of made sure it was going in a direction we thought made sense. But I think having everyone involved in that was a really big help to us um, kind of refocusing the organization on what was important. And again, I think that was probably the big thing. So once we did that, and we looked at it, then we could kind of look at Granite One and say, is this going to help us get to where we want to be? And the answer was very clearly no, um, it just wasn't. And again, not a knock on CMC or Monadnock or Huggins and joining, making the system, but it was more just 
reflecting back on it in a better way to say, you know, we're not going to get to where we want to be as part of this. And again, as I mentioned, kind of realizing the state wasn't going to let us become part of Dartmouth because of Granite One, which was just shocking to me. You know, it just seems such an obvious thing that this would help us get into a bigger system like Dartmouth. And in the end, it didn't. Uh, I mean, I think that's critical. You know, I'm, I'm glad kind of evaluating your position helped come to a consensus about it too and be a unified, you know, board, leadership, medical staff around that. I think it was really smart. You do have a lot of opinions flying at you. Don't get me wrong when you're in those processes, but at the end of the day, it's nice if you can all get to a unified vision, vision moving forward. So, you know, you guys decided to, to exit from Granite One Health, you you reached that decision. What would you classify? You know, I think you've mentioned that you know not being able to affiliate with a larger organization was a big one. Um, you didn't have the strategic uh, kind of historic helping that you wanted to get from from other partners in Granite One to advance your position. Any other thoughts on what you know were the key factors and drivers for you to leave? Those are probably the biggest ones. I think the ones we touched on already, I'm trying to think if there was anything else maybe. Um, yeah, you know, one thing I did forget to mention actually, and maybe it's the biggest kind of negative towards CMC in some ways was, you know, when we formed Granite One, I had visions, and I think the other CEO at Monadnock, so I wasn't necessarily misled on this, that we would form Granite One and we would stay Granite One going into a bigger system. And what I mean by that was like, you wouldn't be dissolving Granite One to join Dartmouth. But what ended up happening in reality was CMC took the lead, not necessarily Granite One, but CMC took the lead on negotiating with Dartmouth. And one of the first things they kind of decided with Dartmouth was Granite One as an entity was going away and the three hospitals were individually going to join Dartmouth. And so yeah. what you had was you had two at this point now, two of the strongest, largest critical access hospitals in New Hampshire, not really being represented well going into Dartmouth. I wasn't even at the table for some of the conversations. And I thought, wow, that's not how I pictured this working out. Like I pictured the three CEOs being at the table united saying, hey, Dartmouth, this is what we want. When in reality, it was just CMC saying, this is what we want. And oh, by the way, we have these two critical access hospitals that are kind of throw-ins to the deal. You know, I, I jokingly said at one point, I, for any sports enthusiasts out there, I felt like Huggins and Mananoc were becoming like those minor league players to get thrown into a big deal and no one ever talks about them. It was like, wow, that kind of felt disrespectful in some well, ways. Again, not to brag about where we're at, but Huggins and Mananoc had worked really hard to build strong balance sheets. And, you know, you mentioned our 80 days cash and I'll just point out that's, that was our operating cash. If you throw all our investments into that, we got about 300 days cash on hand potentially. You know, so we're we're strong hospital. So to not feel like I had a seat at the table that I thought I would, that was one point. I'm glad you you asked that question, Claire, because I forgot to mention that. And it was a big point for us to say, you know, I don't think this grain at one thing is exactly what we thought it would be. Yeah, that's not, you know, living up to the partnership that was initially thought to be on the table. And I, I'm glad you said that Monadnock felt that way, too, as the two critical access hospitals that were involved. You know, it's it was unfortunate that CMC at the time was not understanding the value you were bringing to the table. And that's such a key component, right? You know, critical access hospitals have a lot to bring to the table and they have a lot of value and they have a lot of, you know, if we're just talking, let's not talk about clinical or operational benefit because they have a ton of that. But if you're just talking financials too, there's a ton of value for both sides that can be gleaned from a proper partnership. So it's unfortunate that that, you know, was, was, was not the case. So now, you know, you've, you've exited, you've chosen to, you've chosen to utilize your exit clause. You've withdrawn from Granite One with the others and dissolved it. Talk to me a little bit about the reaction of your community to the news of this this decision. There must have been a reaction in the community of going, wait, what? We're not part of a larger system anymore. We're just an independent critical access hospital. The concern I had was more the reaction within the hospital initially, because I kind of felt like they were the ones that knew more about it anyway. And that, for the most part, went pretty well, because I think they saw the lack of results, right? And I 
I kept them informed all along the way about what we were doing with Dartmouth and where we were at as far as our initiatives with the, the affiliation. They saw us fail to implement an EMR with Catholic Medical Center. So they already kind of knew. So I think they weren't overly surprised. They were kind of almost welcoming, I think, the change to going back to us being independent and reassessing our options. As far as the community too, it wasn't a whole lot of reaction uh, from most people. I think a lot of people don't really follow it much. I think as long as they're getting the services they, they want, they need, and they're getting high quality services and having a good experience, they don't really notice the kind of background of what system you're in. And, and we intentionally kept Granite One a little bit in the background. We didn't want it to be out in the forefront. We wanted each hospital to be more out in the forefront. So there wasn't a lot of reaction. I think the one reaction I will speak to was those that were in the know. So the people who follow what's going on in healthcare, you know, kind of, you know, I did talk to some of them individually. Some of them are our donors, for example, um, business people, retired business people that are, you know, a vacation here that I spoke to. Some of them were a little concerned. They said, wow, geez, you know, how could you survive not being in a system? You know, so first I'd have to explain to them, well, we weren't really in a system. It was very loosely Thanks. held. We didn't really get a lot of benefit. And then explain to them that, you know, it, it's when you look at New Hampshire, there's not a lot of system presence from about where Huggins is located north. You know, there's really not, it's more the southern part of New Hampshire and the state like Massachusetts has a lot of systems, Maine does, but then Vermont to our west really doesn't have a lot of systems either. So it's not really necessarily everything you hear reported that every hospital is joining systems. It's the only way to survive. Yes, it is true for a lot, but I had to kind of re-educate some people that um, it's not as concerning as it might sound. So that was probably really the only reaction that I got or that I was a little surprised by people being as concerned as they were about us getting out of Granite One. As far as reactions go, that's pretty good to not have a, a, a lot of people really, really be against it or all that surprised. Well, I know we're coming up on time, so I want to, you know, ask my my final big question for you is, what were the most important lessons that Huggins learned from this experience? If you had, you know, one or two big takeaways for for others who are potentially thinking about this process, what would that be? Yeah, that's great. I think I'll just back reiterate again on the exit clause thing. That was a huge lesson learned for me and our our leadership team and our board. That, you know, like I already said, it seemed like a huge win. Um, but if any of you are listening and you're thinking of joining a system and you want that exit clause, fine, but just know what you're getting yourself into and just have your expectations aligned. You know, if you give up full control to a system like Dartmouth Hitchcock, you're likely to get more results out of it. You're going to you're going to give up control and there's going to be some pain to that as well. But if you really want them to invest in your hospital and your community, you really it just feels like you have to give up some level of control that they know you aren't just going to walk away from this at, you know, at any point. Um, so for me, that was one of probably the biggest lessons learned. And then the next probably biggest one would be, um, you know, like I've already said again, join a system to help you attain your strategic goals. Don't have it be your strategic initiative. You know, we were so focused on a system that I think we lost sight of really what we were trying to do or accomplish. We just thought it was gonna solve problems. We held off on doing things. That would be kind of a subset lesson learned on that one. Like, don't put off the things you need to do thinking, well, we're gonna be in a system in a year or two. That, that's when we'll do X, Y, or Z. No, you gotta keep working on that stuff. We, we lost, you know, probably years of time just so focused on being in a system, you know, don't lose sight of the things that you need to get done and just keep working on them. Those would probably be the biggest lessons learned for me. Hey, I think those are so critical. Being able to do performance improvement and work on the what you've outlined already, as well as figuring out partnerships with another system. I think having both of those run as parallels is, is so critical. And to be able to have focus on both of those is definitely a lot, but it's so worth it in the end, right? You know, you, you, know you need to be able to, to do both of those to maintain it. Well, Jeremy, I, I don't think we're going to have time for, for questions today because we are right at the half hour mark. But thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to chat with us. This has been great. Um, if other folks have questions or you know want to get in contact, please feel free to contact me and I can push them along to Jeremy or put you in contact directly with Jeremy with his permission. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy. This has been such a great time and hope you have a good, good rest of your day and weekend. Yeah, thank that, you so much. 
Yeah. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Wade Gallen, who's going to talk about some best practices that are with cost reports. Wade, over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Claire, for that introduction. And it was a, a great informative session just now. We are going to um, move into cost reporting. So the good old technical area of cost reporting, best practices and opportunities. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you all and going over um, really what Stroudwater considers to be best practices and then some of the um, primary opportunities we see uh, as we help hospitals review their cost reports and understand um, cost-based reimbursement really for our critical access hospitals. Quick overview of our agenda today. We're going to do a very high level overview. First of all, everything in this uh, presentation today is going to be high level. Um, the cost report as a disclaimer for those of you who might not be super aware of the cost report or don't spend a significant amount of time in there. It's a very technical document. There's um, a lot of nuanced um, information that's included in there. So when we're going to be going over all of the different opportunities, the best practices, again, keeping it at a high level is, is the goal today because um, depending upon your hospital operations, there are so many nuances that could impact um, your Medicare cost report and how you go about preparing it. But that being said, we're going to do an overview of you know, critical access hospital reimbursement, at least on the, um, the governmental side. We're going to be talking about some of the best practices that we see, and then some of the common reimbursement opportunities, again, that we see when we're reviewing cost reports with our, our clients. Jumping right in, just just to kind of set our minds as we go into the best practices and the common opportunities, you know, why are these opportunities common? Why are they important? Why are the best practices that we're going to review important? And the reason being that the Medicare cost report is a, a tool by which many critical access hospitals get paid um, for cost-based reimbursement. So cost-based reimbursement is applicable for our Medicare patients, and in some states, even Medicaid. So cost-based reimbursement essentially says, here are your costs as a critical access hospital. Um, there's usually some rules on what is considered allowable cost, um, but that, that overall cost, you come up with an allowable cost based on certain adjustments and all that, and then that gets factored in to develop a rate. Um, for, from a Medicare perspective, you develop your inpatient per diem, um, you have your cost to charge ratios that'll impact your reimbursement on the non inpatient side of the house as well. Um, so cost based reimbursement is a really beneficial area in some ways for critical access hospitals right if you think about where where we're located it's often in very rural areas low populations. Um, the, the volume is generally not significant enough. Um, to, to, to grow beyond a certain extent. And so what cost-based reimbursement can do is it can help partially insulate um, a hospital from the financial impacts of these significant volume declines or these inherently low um, volumes that we see. Um, the, the way it does that is through our cost-based reimbursement. So if we uh, experience a decline in our volumes, but our cost structure remains relatively intact, what happens, at least again, for our governmental payers, you know, Medicare, in some states, Medicaid will pay on a cost-based basis, um, you will see your rate start to increase. Because um, again, it's based on your, your costs, your allowable cost. Now, cost-based reimbursement does not protect a hospital from all financial woes, and it doesn't negate the need for prudent cost management strategies, right? Um, cost-based reimbursement generally will only apply to your governmental payers, again, Medicare, and in some states, Medicaid, though a substantial amount of your patient population, or oftentimes it's a substantial part of your patient population, but it's not everybody. So even if you get cost-based reimbursement for some of those payers, that will only be applicable to that portion of your payer mix. Um, you still need to develop uh, prudent cost management strategies and um, seek other means of financial performance improvement. But the Medicare cost report is crucial in driving your cost-based reimbursement. Um, and that's why we want to discuss it today and what is considered best practice because it will impact your rates. Generally speaking, when a critical access hospital files a Medicare cost report, 
usually about five months after the fiscal year ends. They will receive a rate letter from their Medicare administrative contractor, who was formerly known as a fiscal intermediary. Um, if you go back that far in the um, you know, Medicare administration um, lingo, but the Medicare administrative contractor will review your cost report and then develop a rate based on that. So it's really important that we put in the proper time to ensure our cost reports are accurate. So that way we can ensure we're maximizing our cost-based reimbursement. So jumping into the best practices, we have four illustrated here. This is not meant to be a panacea. There are many, many best practices in cost report preparation. What the goal with these four is, is to break it down to a very basic level. So these are very encompassing best practices. And if you're doing these things well, I would argue that you are really on the right track to making sure you're optimizing reimbursement and preparing your cost report with the maximum accuracy. The first best practice we have here is really reviewing your mapping. So when you're preparing the Medicare cost report, there is a concept of a matching concept um, that is applied to Medicare cost reports. And this means that we wanna make sure our expenses and our revenues are appropriately matched within what the cost report calls a cost center. So there are many different cost centers on the cost report. You have overhead cost centers, you have you know, your inpatient cost centers, you've got ancillary cost centers. But when we're preparing our cost report, what it requires is that we take our financial information and we properly map, sometimes it's referred to as mapping, our expenses to a cost center and then ensuring that our revenues are also mapped to that cost center. It might sound, you know, if, you've, if you haven't spent enough time in the cost report or much time there at all, it might sound like a relatively easy thing to do, but it is not, um, or at least it's not often that easy to do just because of the way accounting systems are set up and the way that hospitals will structure their you know, general ledger, how they, how they do things internally. Um, it can really be a challenge, but it's a crucial best practice as we look to maximize our reimbursement. Um, the potential issue is that if we don't have appropriate matching, what it's gonna do is it's gonna, um, it's going to create a situation in which our allowable cost is a bit off. Um, so you have your Medicare cost to charge ratios, which is a comparison of what they refer to as fully allocated cost. So you'll have your, um, you know, your inpatient cost centers, your ancillary cost centers. And what the cost report does is it allocates overhead to those departments. So what you're left with at the end of the day is this fully allocated cost. And so that allocated cost gets compared to gross charges, less the professional component of those charges to come up with a cost to charge ratio, which is then applied to the Medicare charges, which we'll look at a little bit later, but they generally come from your PSNR. Um, when we're mapping, we usually refer to the trial balance and sometimes hospitals will utilize a revenue detail file, which is often broken down by revenue code or charge code or some other breakout based on their internal systems. And then the Medicare PSNR, which is a summary of your Medicare information for a given fiscal year. It includes things like charges, days, discharges, uh, payments received from the Medicare pro program. And so hospitals will often use these three documents to conduct the mapping that occurs um, specific to revenues and expenses. So the best practice here is really to make sure we have a proper review process in place. Um, you know, back when I was preparing cost reports and um, there was a number of different tests you could do to kind of review mappings at a high level and then drill down if needed. Um, it's really important to have a process in place that will help you to detect um, anomalies from year to year, but also give you a good sense of am I appropriately matching expenses with revenues on the cost report because it will impact your Medicare reimbursement. So again, best practice is just to have that be uh, formal, to have a review process needs to happen at least annually when you file your cost report and more so if you're filing interim cost reports or you're monitoring your settlement throughout the year, which we'll touch on very shortly here. 
The next best practice is really centered around your overhead cost allocations. As I talked about before, what the cost report does is it takes your overhead. So what they consider overhead is your administrative costs at the critical access hospital, your, you know, your dietary um, costs, your uh, maintenance and repairs. Um, you know, we have depreciation and other capital related costs. It, a lot of, they, they are designated on the Medicare cost report, but you have this bundle of cost that goes into overhead cost centers. And what the cost report does is it, it tells you to allocate those costs to all the other non-overhead cost departments based on a certain methodology. So the potential issue is that if we are not having overhead cost allocations accurately reflect overhead resource use, it can potentially dilute some of our cost centers, which can have a negative impact on our reimbursement. Um, the, the potential issue that we often hear um, hospitals refer to is that Medicare has prescribed cost allocation methodology. So when you prepare the cost report, you're not supposed to start from scratch, right? Medicare has highlighted some methodologies um, if you read through the provider reimbursement manual um, and other references, it'll show some of these cost allocation methodologies. Um, we will often hear that, you know, these are the prescribed cost allocation methodologies and the hospital will leave it at that. Um, however, there is opportunity for you to work with your Medicare administrative contractor and there's a formal process you need to go through but you can seek approval for a change in the way you are allocating your overhead cost um, on the Medicare cost report. It's, um, it does require that coordination, so it, it, it's an extra step in some ways, but what we often find is that it can help enhance reimbursement if we look at these cost allocation methodologies, because you know from a, a cost reporting perspective, allowable cost is, is what we wanna maximize here. Um, allowable costs will go into determining our Medicare per diems, our Medicare outpatient rates. Um, and so it's really important to maximize that in, in a way that makes sense and, and that's feasible. So overhead cost allocations are a great way to think about that a little bit more. And we just often find that critical access hospitals will kind of, and really all hospitals, to be quite honest, they'll kind of coast, uh, they'll put it on cruise control once they establish a methodology and they won't really go back and review them um, on a consistent basis and think through critically, you know, does this make sense? Is there a different way to do this? Is there an opportunity here for us to work with our MAC to figure out another scenario? Um, so the best practice we, we recommend is just to review these on at least an annual basis. Uh, more frequently, again, similar to our revenue and expense mappings, review them uh, more often, especially if you're filing interim cost reports. We want to make sure that these make sense, that they're accurate. Um, and then, you know, if there's opportunity, we'll talk about it a little later, you know, working with your Medicare administrative contract and adjust these. Tracking the settlement. So this is an important task, especially for critical access hospitals, um, because really the med the settlement, so Backing up a little bit, for Medicare, um, traditional Medicare, they settle up at the end of each year, meaning similar to a tax return for us individuals, they will look at the amount that they paid you throughout the year, the hospital, that they paid the critical access hospital for Medicare patients, and then they will compare that to the results of the cost report, essentially what the cost report is saying you are owed as a critical access hospital, and then if there's a difference, whether that's a negative difference in that the hospital owes Medicare money or positive, meaning that Medicare owes the hospital money, um, they, will, they will settle up. So at the end of the year, generally speaking, critical access hospitals will either be writing a check to Medicare or receiving a check from Medicare. And so it's really important to track this because it fluctuates based on your cost structure, changes in revenue. You know, there are so many things for a critical access hospital that can cause your settlement to change um, that it's really important to monitor this throughout the year. Um, again, the potential issue given cost-based reimbursement, critical access hospital settlements are a moving target. So one from a certainly financial perspective, 
it's financially prudent for a critical access hospital to have some sense of what they're expecting from, from really all their payers. Um, but because of cost-based reimbursement, it makes it especially tricky. And it's really important for critical access hospitals to monitor this throughout the year. There should be no surprises at, at year end. You shouldn't be sitting there saying, oh my goodness, I owe you know, half a million dollars to Medicare and I have no idea why. It, it really should be a consistent process throughout the year. Another thing to note too, and why tracking the settlement is important is because if we are looking at our settlement and we're seeing huge receivable from Medicare continue to grow throughout the year, um, that's, that's cash that um, we, if we were to file an interim cost report, again, based on the, the results of what's going on at that point in time, year to date, um, there will be a settlement process associated with that. And there are, it's not, um, there are nuances to that, of course, but Medicare will at least settle up at the end of each year. For our Medicare Advantage plans, though, they often do not settle up at the end of each year based on your allowable costs, your Medicare cost report. So the way it works is you will submit a cost report to Medicare, they'll approve it, go through their process there, issue some funds or request funds back, depending upon the results of that. And what a critical access hospital can do is provide their latest Medicare rate schedules from the Medicare administrative contractor to their MA plans so that they can be paid in accordance with the most recent information. So why, why is this a challenge? So if you are being significantly underpaid throughout the year by Medicare traditional and you are tracking your settlement and you realize this, it's really important to think about you know, filing an interim cost report so that way you can get those enhanced rates and send them off to your MA payers so that way you can increase the likelihood of getting reimbursed at that higher amount, because again, we're not expecting uh, Medicare Advantage to settle up at the end of each year. So it's really important for us to be monitoring this. Um, the best practice is to monitor it throughout the year. Um, there are models that you can either purchase or develop internally that will help you track where your settlement is at um, throughout the year. And so it's really important to work with whatever resources we have to get that going to really make sure that we are on top of it, that we have no surprises throughout the year and at year end. And then the last best practice, which is, you know, these best practices are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So they feed off of each other, they're related to each other. When we say cost report reviews here, what we're talking about is a review of the entire cost report. So we know that we're reviewing our mappings throughout the year. We're reviewing where we're putting our expenses, our revenues. We know about our overhead cost allocation methodologies. We're feeling good about those. But when we're looking at filing our cost report, it's really important to develop a formal review process. Um, you're required to file these Medicare cost reports on at least an annual basis if there are things like a change in ownership, or other operational changes, there, there are some exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, you must file a Medicare cost report annually. And you are attesting, so the CEO, the CFO, whoever it is at the critical access hospital is attesting to the accuracy of this document that's being submitted to the feds. And so it's very important to feel confident about what you're reporting in there. Um, the potential issue here is that the cost report is complex. There, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of calculations that go into preparing this cost report. Um, there are many regulatory references. And given the complexity of the cost report, there are plenty of opportunities for errors and inconsistencies. There's plenty of opportunities for us to not maximize our cost-based reimbursement using the, this cost report, um, which is why a multi-tiered review, whether it's internal or external, of the Medicare cost report before filing is really a best practice here. The reason is when you are preparing a cost report, whoever it is within your organization, or maybe it is you hire that out to a local accounting firm, whoever it is, the person preparing the cost report is in the weeds. They're looking at, you know, trial balance accounts, and they're trying to figure out you know, what is this other revenue account? And do we need to offset expenses based on it? Uh, what are these related party transactions? Um, how do we account for that? You know, are we, are we properly, um, you know, excluding our professional charges on our worksheet C? Uh, there are so many things that go into it. And so 
it can be hard, you know, as many can probably attest to when you're in the weeds to take a step back and take a truly objective look at what you've prepared and think about all the different areas where uh, there might be mistakes or maybe we just need to dig in a little bit more and shore some things up. And it's just good to get other people's perspectives because um, we don't know everything. And so that is why this is the best practice. Again, it's, it's easier said than done, but it'll result in a much higher quality product. We also recommend that you, know, you consider review post-filing um, with a focus more on looking for opportunities within the cost report, as opposed to you know, purely did we calculate this correctly and whatnot, because there are plenty of opportunities there as well. And I like to include this. This is your worksheet S, your settlement summary on the Medicare cost report. And it shows whether at the end of the day you owe money to Medicare or you owe, or you are owed money from Medicare. In this case, this provider was, um, they owed Medicare some money at the end of their, their year at the time of the cost report filing. But the thing I wanna highlight here is that one sentence that you'll see in yellow, which says that, you know, it's estimated that it takes about 674 hours to you know, prepare these Medicare cost reports, um, which is significant. And if you've prepared a cost report before, you kind of have a, a sense of, or at least you can relate to the significant amount of work that goes into it. There's far more than just typing numbers in on a, on a you know, software or on an Excel spreadsheet. There's a lot more thinking that goes into it in coordination. And so it just further emphasizes the opportunity for errors and mistakes that we need to mitigate by having a multi-tiered review process. All right, so we have completed our very high level review of best practices. There's a lot in there, a lot of nuance that, again, if you're interested in learning more about, um, I'm happy to talk cost reports with you, um, you know, all day until I'm blue in the face. It's going to be a great conversation. Uh, definitely reach out to me if you'd like to talk a little bit more about those details, but we're going to jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater. Um, for a little background, you know, we, we review many different cost reports, mostly for critical access hospitals to identify areas of opportunity that are often missed. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions around the cost report or just um, challenges in understanding the right information that will go into a cost report. Uh, there's sometimes a, a general lack of understanding as to how the cost report impacts your reimbursement. Um, I remember this being the case back when I was in the provider setting and, you know, different departments of, of the hospital really don't have a good sense of, you know, what the reimbursement function is and the cost report and all that, nor should they become experts. But so there, there's a lot of things out there. And so these are some of the common reimbursement opportunities we see when we're working with critical access hospitals. First of which is Medicare bad debts, which is one that is, um, I don't wanna say near and dear to my heart, that makes it seems like it, it's a, a positive thing. Medicare bad debts has been something I've been involved in since I started way, um, you know, back right out of college when I joined a Medicare administrative contractor. Um, so the general principle is that if you have patients who are traditional Medicare and they have a deductible or co-insurance amount, so your patient responsibility that remain unpaid, those amounts can be included as allowable cost on your cost report and therefore reimbursed by Medicare. Um, there are requirements behind it. Some are listed uh, below, but they will reimburse up to 65% of what they consider to be allowable Medicare bad debts. So we, we often find that the opportunity here is that hospitals are not properly tracking their bad debts, or they're claiming them in an incorrect period. There's a number of different reasons why that might occur, including the way a critical access hospital is um, tracking the bad debts internally. Um, we often find that there is a lack of you know, adequate documentation. So bad debts are an area of focus for um, at least the Medicare administrative contractor I worked for. Um, they really focus in on bad debts and we'll see, do you have the necessary documentation to support these? Um, so there, there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of uh, challenges with Medicare bad debt reporting. But at the end of the day, it's a reimbursement opportunity for a provider. Um, this is an example of your, you know, worksheet E-3 part five of a hospital showing on line 25, you have your allowable bad debts. That's your total. 
The line below that, line 26, is your 65% for the amount that you will actually be reimbursed. And then 27 represents the bad debts for dual eligible beneficiaries, which are Medicare and Medicaid dual eligible patients. They are reported separately because they are audited separately. Um, when a MAC doesn't audit bad debts, they, they look at different bad debts in different ways. And so it's important to have that understanding going into it. This is again on your outpatient side, your worksheet part B, similar principle here. Really the solution for this opportunity is to make sure you're properly tracking your bad debts. We often find that critical access hospitals you utilize collection agencies and um, have challenges you know, bringing those back from collection agencies. That's a big area of disallowance we see. So it's really about maintaining that proper documentation, ensuring that bad debts are properly closed in the correct period, et cetera. Moving forward to our next opportunity is the overhead cost allocations that we discussed earlier. Um, I won't spend too much time because we kind of touched on a big area of this in the, the best practices section, but what we often find the opportunity being is that hospitals don't utilize the best cost finding method. The, the reimbursement manual, the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations refers to it as cost finding instead of you know, cost allocation. Um, but we often find that there's little correlation between actual overhead usage and the cost allocation or cost finding method. And so that poses risks of us, um, in the worst case scenario, uh, reducing our allowable costs because we inappropriately allocated overhead costs to one area, um, or we double counted, or we excluded some overhead allocations. Uh, all of that is, is a challenge. Um, you will find these on worksheet B-1 and B part one um, and B part two. I didn't include them because the worksheet is quite a bear to look at on a single screen. And so I didn't want to um, plague you all with that. But we, we consider the solution here to be really doing a thorough review of these on an annual basis as we talked about in best practice and um, working with your local MAC to consider adjusting if determined to be advantageous or if it makes sense for your facility. Related parties. So this has become a much bigger opportunity as of late, as we see more critical access hospitals beginning to affiliate with larger health systems or at least participate in some form of management agreement in which the critical access hospital will pay a certain amount um, for shared services within that system. And then what they will do is oftentimes receive a cost allocation from the home office, which can either increase or reduce your allowable cost, therefore affecting your rates. Um, what we really see the opportunity here is that a lot of critical access hospitals we talk to just kind of accept things as they are. They don't really work with their local system to understand these allocations, where understanding them is really important from both the critical access hospitals perspective and from the system's perspective, given cost-based reimbursement and some of the implications of the ways that they're doing this. The solution we see is partnering with your related party organization, generally a larger health system to make sure that we are we're reporting these accurately and that we're maximizing as much as we can. This is reported on your worksheet A-8-1. And we see this again as a growing opportunity for critical access hospitals. And again, just showing you here, so they essentially take the amount of allowable costs. This is the amount that has been allocated from a, a home office or another a related party organization and comparing it to the amount of expense reported on the books of the critical access hospital. Um, and they compare if, if the amount of allowable costs exceeds the amount on your books, then you get a positive adjustment. And if it's the other way around, you get a negative adjustment or a reduction to allowable costs. Again, the idea is to shore up to the actual cost incurred. Another opportunity we see, the second to last one here is um, provider, or I'm sorry, physician standby on-call costs in the emergency department. So if we have a, a provider or physician working in the emergency department, but they are not spending time seeing patients, they're not actually involved in patient care, but they're really just there, you know, it's standby time or, or they're, they're in the ED performing administrative functions, those costs can be considered allowable and therefore can increase your, your Medicare allowable costs in total, increase your rates. Um, we find that providers often are not reporting this accurately. When you do calculations, you'll, you'll see that, you know, we're often reporting that our ED providers spend 
a significant amount of time with patients in the ED per visit, um, well above what we would expect from best practice. And so the solution here is really to uh, either engage in, in time studies or utilize alternative measurement options. You know, they have a lot of electronic based systems now that you can utilize to really get this right. So that way you can maximize your reimbursement. Again, just showing, showing this here, I'm gonna forego that for the sake of time, but these slides will be available. And then the final one being our provider-based rural health clinic reporting. The long story short here is that we need to make sure that the visits for reporting and the cost and um, our, our FTEs that we report on our M series of the Medicare cost report for our provider-based rural health clinics are actually for rural health clinic services. We often find that there's inaccurate reporting and calculations of this, um, and it can skew uh, essentially um, eat into our AIR or our all-inclusive rate for our provider-based RHCs. Um, again, this is just an example here. I know we're right at time, so I'm just gonna cut right to the chase and say the solution is to make sure we're reviewing this consistently and that we're properly excluding um, non-RHC services from those calculations on our M series for our provider-based rural health clinics. And with that, I you know I'm right at time here, so I, I maybe a minute over. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Amy, who's going to speak about pricing transparency. If anybody has any questions on the cost reporting side, please reach out to me directly and I'd love to, to speak with you. So thank you for your time this afternoon. Hey, Wade, thanks for talking about the cost report. It's always um, fun to find ways to save money for your facilities and the opportunities that are out there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and you should be able to see the presentation. Thank you all for joining today, for staying on the line. We've had some great presentations so far and I um, hope that I ended the presentation well for you, this, this webinar that we've had today. So we're gonna talk for the next few minutes about pricing transparency, non-compliance and how to fix it. And so, you know, some of you may know what this is, may not know what it is. So the objectives, one of the things we're gonna do is just really level set the ground, understand what price transparency is, why is it out there? And then a tale from a small hospital. Um, you know, what is that tale that we've got a story, a case study out there that I'm going to share with you. I'm just giving one example today, but I'll be honest with you. I've got about five other friends that have experienced same or similar type situations. So um, they're paying attention to us. And then how to address that violation. So that small hospital did receive a violation and I'll share with you how to address it. And then some key learnings throughout the process. So when looking at this, what is price transparency? Well, back in 2019, November 2019, CMS finalized the current year 2020 hospital outpatient PBS policy changes and payment rates and ambulatory surgical center payment system policy changes and payment rates, colon, pricing transparency requirements for hospitals to make standard public, CMS-1717-F2. We're gonna call that pricing transparency if you don't mind because as you can tell, I couldn't get through it in one breath. So this went into effect on January 1st, 2021. And yes, even with the pandemic happening in 2020, it still went into effect on January 1st of 2021. It was required or it is required from all licensed hospitals in the United States. And what it does is it provides an accessible pricing information in two ways. There's a comprehensive machine readable file. We'll talk about that. And then there's a display of shoppable services in a consumer friendly format. And those shoppable services are items that can be shopped in advance that people will look for those in advance. And here's the real kicker, failure to comply so yeah, we've got this lot here, but failure to comply will result in a civil monetary penalty of $300 per day per hospital with a bed count of 30 or fewer. So if you're a critical access hospital, $300 a day would be the fine for not complying. And then if you're um, greater than 30, day, 30 beds, it's $10 per bed per day. So there are monetary fines assessed to it. And um, this story that we're going to talk about today is just how that happens. Um, when looking at it, I told you there were two ways that we do it. One is that con 
two ways that need to be um, producing this information and sharing this information out there. The first one is that comprehensive machine readable file. Now, what this is, remember back in the day when you would just have to post your charge master out there, you'd have to have all your standard charges posted on your website. Well, now you have to have that but really pumped up with gas. You know, it's cooking with gas now that it has all standard charges for all items and services for all locations operating under a single hospital license. That includes your clinics out there. It must be posted on a publicly available website, meaning that it's got to be on a website that the public can get to. Can't be hidden back behind the scenes and things like that. It must be publicly available. It's easily, easily accessible without barriers, but they've got to find it. And then it needs to be digitally searchable. It's updated at least once annually, and it follows a standard naming convention. And it contains the following data elements. So there's a description of each item, a discounted cash price, the charge that applies to an individual who pays cash or cash equivalent for the services. There's a payer specific negotiated charge, a de-identified minimum and a de-identified maximum negotiated charge. I find it very interesting that they give you a lot of leeway here to how you want to design this comprehensive machine readable file, but you have to include all your payer names with all of the information, but then they want you to identify, de-identify the minimum and the maximum. I'm like, well, the information's there. Can't you just go look? Nope, they want you to have that included. So just keep that in mind. So when thinking about it's your standard charge master, but with all these additional data elements that are attached to it. Now the shoppable services file, this is a file where services, you would think about shopping for them. So like a CT of your head, you know, or a CT of your head with or without contrast. Those are items that are required to be on the shoppable service list. There are 70, and so when I say required, what I mean is that there are 70 codes that CMS says you must, or 70 shoppable services that say you must include these items in your list, whether you provide it or not. If you don't provide it, you just put not provided by hospital, but it must be on your list. And then that entire list of shoppable services, there are 300 items that need to be included on it. The first 70 are required, so if you don't do all of those 70 services, you got to make up the difference to get to a total of 300 shoppable services. And an appendix, so as they said in the beginning, you're going to get a copy of the recording and you'll get a copy of all of these presentations. And so in the appendix for this presentation, I have included what those 70 items are. So you'll see it takes up about three pages, but that information is posted out there. It also, in that shoppable services file, includes ancillary services that are connected with those 300 shoppable items. So one of the items that's on the list is a comprehensive metabolic panel. So when you think about that comprehensive metabolic panel, you're like, well, here's the charge it is for coming to our hospital. But do you also have an associated blood draw with that? Because it's a blood test. So do you build that blood draw? Well, that is one of those ancillary items that would be connected with the 300 shoppable services. So when thinking about that, you know, you've got to look at it in a um, holistic manner of here is the procedure that's being done. Here's the service provided to your patients, to your community. And with that service, what are all of those additional services connected with it? Now, with this shoppable service file, you include all locations that are operating under a single hospital license. So if you do a comprehensive metabolic panel at your clinic and you also do it at the hospital, those need to be included on your shoppable service list. Again, it must be posted on a publicly available website, easily accessible without barriers, digitally searchable, updated at least once annually. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Both of these files need to be updated at least once annually. But in the, in the case of a shoppable service file, there is also a patient estimator tool that you can use instead. It's an approved option. So with that, 
additionally related to the shoppable services, very similar to that comprehensive um, machine readable file, is that you have a description of each item. It's the ancillary services connected with those identified services. And then if it was a CMS specified, those 70, and it's not offered at your hospital, you actually have to give an indicator that says, we don't offer that. And then for both the shoppable service item and the ancillary service, you have to provide the discounted cash price. To, that would be like the charge that applies to an individual who pays cash or cash equivalent. And when they refer to charge, it's the amount you will get paid, not your fee schedule amount. It's your payment amount. And then you have that payer specific negotiated charge. Think about it for a minute. Let's just pause here and think. When's the last time you went and pulled your payer contracts for your location? Do you have them in a central repository? Well, you actually have to have those rates that you will get paid. And you may have the contract, but do you have the most recent fee schedule of what that payer is going to pay you? That's the information that you need to make sure is included in your shoppable services file, as well as in that comprehensive machine readable file. It's that negotiated rate. And one of those things to take into consideration is if your Advantage plans that you have a contract with, if they are agreeing to pay what your rate is for your hospital that you received as part of your rate letter from Medicare, you need to include that as well. Those rates have to be listed. And then again, the one that just makes me shake my head is got to be have that de-identified minimum and de-identified maximum negotiated charge. It's listed there. You just pull the highest and the lowest and include that information in your shoppable services file. Now I'll go over all of this. You know, remember when I said a minute ago that it's $300 per day is the fine? Well, how do they enforce this? Well, here's what new guidance that was released as of April 26th of 2023. You know, people had asked me in the beginning, Amy, do you really think this is gonna last? And I'd be like, I don't know, but right now they're supposed to be fining. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, they're fining hospitals. And now we'll tell you they're fining, they're issuing these notices to critical access hospitals. So my answer is yes. And they are releasing new guidelines as, as uh, frequently as about a month and a half ago. And what CMS is doing is it's strengthening its enforcement of this rule. There are stricter timelines, and the fines are levied more quickly. And so how that process works is that it's a two-step process generally in that the first step is a notice of violation. There's a 90-day window that you get to remediate on this notice of violation. And if you don't remediate that notice of violation, it, it then goes to a corrective action plan where you have to submit a corrective action plan to Medicare, to CMS to let them know that you are working on it. And that's, that corrective action plan has to be submitted within 45 days of the date of notice. And then you have 90 days to get your hospital in full compliance with pricing transparency. Now, I say that it's a two-step process. However, hospitals that don't make any attempt to satisfy the requirement, meaning that, you know, you don't have anything posted. They can't find anything posted out there on your website. There's no machine readable file. There's no shoppable services file. They're no longer issuing that notice of violation. They are now immediately skipping to the corrective action plan, meaning that you have 90 days to get your hospital in full, a full compliance with it before they're going to assess a fine. So just know that, that they have, re, they have issued stricter guidelines around it. And essentially, if you get a notice of violation, you must be in full compliance within 180 days, you know, because they'll put you into that corrective action plan piece of it, or, you know, just get it in place. So I tell you all of this, and now I'm going to tell you a tale from a small hospital. So this was Allegheny Health. They're, they're friends of mine. They've, uh, they've given me permission to just share their information. They are a 25-bed critical access hospital located in Sparta, North Carolina. So they're small like many of you are, small facilities. And the shoppable services, they actually thought they had a patient estimator tool. They were posting it out there using this free tool that they had. 
But like many other critical access hospitals, they struggled to identify the 300 unique shoppable services that they offer for their facility. Because typically these free tools are using remit data, not charge master data. And so when you think about the volume of your patients coming through, you don't really have that many 300 unique items. You may offer them at your facility, but you don't have the patient volume that goes along with that. And so they received a hospital price transparency warning notice from CMS stating that they were non-compliant with the requirements. Now let's talk a little bit more about this violation. How it works is that CMS has built into that legislation, you know, that big pricing transparency legislation I started out with. Well, they've built into their legislation the method for how they will evaluate if a hospital is in compliance. The first way is that they'll audit your hospital's website. The second way is they'll evaluate complaints that they've received from CMS. And then the third way is that they will review individuals or other entities' analysis of noncompliance. So there are three ways that they actually get the information to say you are in violation or out of violation. Now, Allegheny, they received a notice on a Tuesday in November. Now, this Tuesday in November was right after Thanksgiving, and it stated that a review of the hospital's website had occurred on the previous Wednesday the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So they, in that notice of violation that came through, it's very helpful. It says, hey, you have a violation and here's where we see your violation. It says they had a violation for not posting a comprehensive machine readable file. And they had a violation related to displaying the shoppable services. Specifically, there was no consumer, consumer uh, friendly list of standard services was found. So they were given that, but that's all that violation said. And it also said you have 90 calendar days to remediate these violations. So, you know, when you get a CMS violation, immediate concern is happening at the facility. And so immediate concern was happening at Allegheny and they were like, oh, who can help us remediate this issue? You know, who knows about this violation? And uh, how much is it going to cost? Because, you know, we got a problem out there. How much are we going to need to budget for this? Do we have enough time? Can we get it remediated in 90 days? And my goodness, we've got to do something because 300 days, it's a pretty substantial fine for a critical access hospital. So they got this scary notice and they did some first, they had some steps related to it. The first step, we actually had a call with them on that Tuesday about um, other items that we were working on with them. And so they reached out to us and they're like, Amy, we need some of your time. Can we steal part of this meeting time to discuss this violation? I'm like, of course. So they reached out to a partner who was familiar with their facility as well as pricing transparency. So we knew who they were and we understood the pricing transparency law. They engaged the Office of Rural Health to say, hey, we've got this issue going on. We don't know what the cost to remediate it will be, but could this fall under one of the federal programs that's out there to help us out? And so the Rural Health Office just really had some, you know, was able to provide some assistance with them and partnering with all of us to do it. Allegheny, they formed an internal task force to support the project. So they went together and said, who are we going to put on this? Because we're walking into the holidays. We have 90 days to remediate this, or we're already in the holidays, but we're into the full holiday season. We need to, we've got a uh, partner who can help us out. We've engaged the Office of Rural Health, but we need to make sure that we've got feet on the street that will help us be able to you know, focus on this, pro on this project. They also had to acknowledge that that free one size fits most um, model, it didn't fit for them. They still received that pricing transparency violation. And then we started working to offer a compliant offering. And I will tell you that um, one of the things we did is we started working on the shoppable services offering first, because that was the one that was going to take additional legwork from the hospital, that task force that was there. So we identified 300 total services for inclusion on the list. 
We engage to the clinical teams because remember, excuse me, one of those items is that you have to, have, like one of the items on the CMS list was a colonoscopy. Well, you need to talk to the colonoscopy team, the team, the surgical team to say what all is involved in that. Because you know what? We're in revenue cycle. We might not know all of that. So we engaged the clinical team and then we had to go find the payer contracts, analyzing the payer contracts for payer specific negotiated rates for all of these services. And then what we did is we developed an Excel model that we could post on the Allegheny website. We also leveraged a lot of that information that we did in that shoppable services offering to create that comprehensive machine readable file. So we got their entire charge master, we put it in. We didn't have to include the ancillary services because they were reported separately throughout that charge master, but we did leverage that payer specific negotiated rate and including that in, in the information that we posted. And we developed a CSV file and posted it on the Allegheny website. We completed it. We posted both of those files online in under 60 days. And then you know what happened? we waited for the stealth ninjas to return because on that violation, it says you've got to do it, but there's no one to communicate, to phone a friend and say, hey, we've got it posted. We had to wait for the stealth ninjas to go behind the scene and look at it. So we waited. And then on in March, 2023, 90 days from the first violation, no, first notice, CMS performed a second review of the Allegheny website. And they determined that it was non-compliant. I'm like, oh no, what did we do? Well, the violation was found that it didn't include any room and board charges. I was like, oh, how did those lines get missed? We missed the, pulling those lines. But the other thing that we did is that we, when the file was posted, it had they had failed to follow the STAMI, standard naming convention. And that standard naming convention is EIN number underscore hospital name underscore standard charges. I think when we posted it initially, we had posted it with um, the tax ID number, not the employer identification number, and that was the difference. And so they, they came back and said, you are in violation. So there were no violations on that shoppable services file, but it was all on that comprehensive machine readable file. So they were then provided 45 days to complete and submit the corrective action plan and Allegheny made the required updates, file save as new name, and put it on their website within three days. So what I will tell you about this though, I'm going to sit here for just a second and say that with this though, not just Allegheny, I have another hospital who had not who received this notice of violation and theirs was that they had not performed that annual review. So when thinking about that annual review, what's the date you have on your file to show CMS that this is that these updates are happening. So they submitted this corrective action plan and when they submitted the corrective action plan, we're like, who do we get in contact with and let them know. And we had to wait for the stealth ninjas to go behind the scenes and review it within 30 days. And they then issued the compliance notice. So we all celebrated about the visit return of the ninjas. But our key learnings were, that, you know what? The reason I bring this up to you, the reason I'm presenting it today is that this wasn't, that this pricing transparency legislation is not just for your large institutions. Rural and critical access hospitals are not exempt. I know, I, as I said earlier, I have five friends, in addition to Allegheny, who have received notice of violation. I actually had one that received the corrective action plan, went straight to corrective action plan. And theirs was because it wasn't in that right, the correct naming convention. So just remember that incorrect naming convention and omission of the last re review date will cause a violation. Make sure it's a simple fix. Make sure that is on your website. And then also to remember that resources are available to, to provide support. You don't have to solve it alone. You know, the CEO is who's going to get that letter. And the CEO is immediately going to call the IT, your CFO, your revenue cycle people to be like, what is this about? What do we need to do? How do we need to remediate it?
There are state resources available as well. Feel free to call me. I've been down this road more than happy to just answer any questions that you may have it have related to it. You don't have to solve this alone. So with that, I just wanted to open it up for some Q&A if anybody had any questions about it, and then to share my contact information. Um, if, you know, I know that we're getting right up on the top of the hour to where we're going to be at the end of our webinar, but just want to say, don't go it alone. Don't freak out. Well, freak out a little, but don't freak out a whole bunch. Um, feel free to give me a call. I'll share with you about what's happened with um, my other friends, how you know, in addition to Allegheny, you can go out to Allegheny's website and see an example of it. And a lot of times when I get that phone call, that's how I know I had five friends, is because they get it. They're like, Amy, what do we need to do? And I'm like, here's what you need to do. And it's a very simple, check the file name. What does the violation notice say? You need to add this and have that information out there just to know. And then also um, as part of the deck, just showing you, here is the appendix of the shoppable services that are required to be posted so that you can see, they may look familiar, a lot of lab tests, CTs, ultrasounds. Um, and then you get into some, some tests like a cervical fu spinal fusion without comorbid conditions or major comorbid com conditions, pretty much not gonna be something we're offering at a critical access hospital but it does impact other facilities. And because of that, you now need to find something to replace that on your list of 300. And I just wanna say, okay, so I'm gonna wrap all that up and say, just thank you. Thank you for attending the conference. I know I'm at the tail end of it. And just wanna say, you know, we're committed to providing high quality learning events for you. So there is going to be a survey that pops up when you sign out of this webinar. Please take some time just to review it so that we can make sure that we are um, supporting you and providing information that is relevant to you and really is helpful. So thank you very much for this time and I appreciate the time you gave me today. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you to everyone who joined us.